at me. Okay, now we're getting to Sully Gibson. Uh, Sully's going to take us on an armchair birding trip. Um, he lives in Alaska, but he happens to be in Northfield tonight. Yeah. I think you're leaving tomorrow, right, Sully? That's correct. Sully grew up in Northfield. He attended New Trier, and he received a bachelor's degree in evolutionary biology from Cornell. He's lived in Anchorage since 2018 and is the tour manager for St. Paul Island Tour, a birding and ecotourism company in the Pribilofs of the, on the Bering Sea. On a side note, you know how you always remember where you saw a life bird? Well, I remember where I saw a life bird and a life birder, Sully. He and I met looking at our lifer purple sandpiper on Waukegan Beach a very long time ago. Um, I'm sure that he couldn't imagine living and working in Alaska at that time or speaking to Lake Cook. But here we are. And so without further ado, I hand the mic to Sully. Thank you very much, Rena. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you, Lake Cook Audubon. So I'm going to share my screen here. There you go. Looks good. Okay. Wonderful. Figure the zoom a little bit here. All right. So this is north to Alaska, birding the last frontier. All right. So Rena already hit on all of these things. Um, the picture that she sent out is a great picture of me. However, I've got a beard now, so that's one difference. Um, and that's me there on St. Paul Island, all suited up for the field. Um, so I'm a Trevian, class of 2012. I don't know if there's any other Trevians on the call with us or any other Cornelians. Um, and now I live in Anchorage, but I spend my summers, COVID notwithstanding, on St. Paul Island in the Pribloffs in the Bering Sea. And at least one of you has seen me out there it sounds like maybe one of you is going to see me out there um, in June. So looking forward to that. Pretty awesome. So Alaska, you probably heard a lot about fun facts, statistics. Um, just a few tend to gloss over the details and it's really hard to grasp all of the, uh, the size of it, all of the depth of Alaska. So 11 times the size of Illinois, which is right off the bat, which is about 20% of the lower 48. Minnesota has 10,000 lakes. We've got 3 million. The coastline of Alaska is more than the entire coastline of the lower 48 combined. We don't have any ticks. We don't have any snakes. Um, however, of course, we've got plenty of other things to worry about, like bears. Uh, the record low temperature I think it was in the 70s up in the interior of Alaska, minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, true temperature, not with wind chill. But the highest it's ever gotten, also in the interior, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which I believe is uh, also the high record high temperature for Hawaii. Both are 100 degrees. But 180 degree swing is just about as big of any swing of any state in the U.S. It's obviously the northernmost state in the United States. Um, however, it's also westernmost. It's farther west than Hawaii. And because several of the Aleutian Islands fall west of the 180th longitude line, technically that's the Eastern Hemisphere. So if you're on any um, trivia game shows, it's also the easternmost state. Uh, that is not Maine, it is Alaska. Only 735,000 residents, very few, not the fewest. That might be like Wyoming, but I think Montana has over a million. Um, so we have way fewer than even Montana and there's no state income tax and even no state sales tax. And one thing too, that I also really wanna highlight and this picture does a really good job of it um, is the footprint that Alaska occupies. So the, the land area is one thing, but just how spread out it is, it, it is literally the width of the entire lower 48. When you're going from the Aleutians to Southeast, it could be kind of like going from California to Florida, which is just uh, mind boggling. So now my job is to 
kind of go over all of Alaska in under an hour here. We'll see how I do. Um, I'm going to try to get a little laser pointer going. Here we go. Can you guys see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. So I'm going to kind of start from a uh, south to north loosely um, and just hit the major regions of Alaska. Southeast Alaska is the most temperate area in Alaska. And this is all rainforest pretty much. It's home to the Tongass National Forest, which is the largest national forest in the United States. It's almost 17 million acres. There's a little logging going on. Um, they want to do a lot more, but um, a lot of federal restrictions, this is federal land, uh, have stopped that, thankfully. This is really, really pristine forest, very rainy um, area. The total rain amounts are a lot, but it's also lots of light rain all day long, misty, cloudy. The people that live in Southeast Alaska are a special breed because they really put up with, the. I mean, it, it makes Seattle look really sunny. Some of the signature birds that you get in the uh, rainforest of Southeast Alaska, Townsend's warblers, varied thrushes, Rufus hummingbirds. Hummingbirds make it up to Alaska. There's even actually um, smaller numbers of Anna's hummingbirds that have moved north into Alaska, and you can find quite a few of them in Southeast. Chestnut back chickadees, all of these birds are very common. So now inching, Actually, some of these islands are farther south than southeast Alaska. However, the ocean around them is much colder, so these are not as temperate. The Aleutian Islands, and that's your chain of islands that reaches out towards the Russian Far East. These are predominantly treeless islands, almost entirely, and they're quite remote, and there's very, very few people that live here. Um, most of these islands are uninhabited. They're quite windy. And pretty, they're known well for very hardcore, harsh weather. Uh, the The show Deadliest Catch is filmed in the Bering Sea, and they they often are going between St. Paul Island and uh, Dutch Harbor on Alaska. And if you've ever seen that show, um, you can kind of get a picture for what the winters are like out there. But people people die. That's how intense it is. This is uh, a picture from a boat in the Aleutian Islands from a few years ago. The Aleutian Islands are on the Ring of Fire. So it's very, very active with volcanoes and uh, earthquakes. Tsunamis are very possible. Uh, probably didn't even hear about this earth, uh, this uh, eruption, but this was like kind of like a, a Wednesday in Alaska. Um, great Sitkin Island, pretty amazing picture. want to hit on the Pribilof Islands because these are near and dear to my heart. This is where I spend my summers from May through October. And they're not technically the Aleutian Islands, but they are in the uh, Aleutians West census area. And they're quite similar. Um, there's no active volcanoes on the, the Pribilofs and there's no snow cap peaks, but we have the seabird cliffs. We have the wildflowers. We're treeless. And the Pribilofs are these two little dots right up here. The St. Paul is the north one and St. George is the south one. St. Paul is where I spend my summers. And that's where there's about a, a village of about 400 indigenous uh, Unungan or Aleut people uh, that live there. It's the largest um, uh, concentration of these indigenous people. And I think maybe the second biggest village in all of the uh, Aleutians West. The biggest would be Dutch Harbor, which is about 5,000 people but that's mostly because of uh, fishing infrastructure. Um, these are the seabird cliffs. And this is on the Pribilofs. We have hundreds of thousands of fur seals, which is what makes them so famous. Uh, back in hundreds of years ago, people were making fur coats and everything out of them. The Pribilofs and the Aleutians in the summertime can be extremely foggy. I've seen days like this go on for almost two weeks and uh, it can be very difficult to get planes in and out when it's really foggy like this uh, but part of the allure is that you know it's not really it's a treat just to get to these places um, 
It's not, not easy, but when you get there, it is worth it. And so some of the signature birds from the Aleutians and the Pribilofs, actually all of these pictures are from St. Paul Island. Um, very famous for seabirds. So we've got crested auklets, upper left, uh, red-faced cormorant on the right, kind of Bering Sea specialties, horned puffin. And then we also have lots of Lapland longspurs, not very many songbirds out there. There's no trees and it's, they're not very big islands, but uh, the few songbirds that we do have, like in addition, snow buntings and uh, rosy finches and Pacific wrens, we actually have quite a few of them. Okay, so now inching towards south central Alaska. This is basically the population hub of Alaska. More, well over half of the people in Alaska live in south central. And I think of it as kind of like a transition zone between the boreal forest of the interior and the rainforest of southeast Alaska. In, um, we have both. We have rainforest near Anchorage. We also have boreal forest. So we have a mix of a lot of birds. Uh, Anchorage is about 300,000 people. That's that bottom picture there. That's our downtown. And uh, above there, that's actually another major city, if you can believe it. That's Seward, Alaska. Um, cruises stop there sometimes. And that's, I don't know, maybe a few thousand people, which is enough to be a major city in Alaska. These birds aren't just restricted to South Central Alaska. However, these are very common, abundant signature birds that you can find around Anchorage, tons of Arctic terns in the marshes, black-billed magpies everywhere. Chickadees are one of the more common backyard birds. It's interesting, they, they're they the same species as the one um, that you have in Chicago, and there's not even any described subspecies. However, they sing a completely different song, um, which kind of surprised me when I first moved to Alaska. And I watched kind warblers. We don't have nearly the diversity of warblers that you have in Illinois. And that's one of the things I miss the most, probably being in Alaska. You can't get 20 species in a day, not even close. All right, the interior. This is the probably the most hardcore place in Alaska. And this is the coldest, even colder than we were talking about Barrow or Utkiyakvik um, in the North Slope, the northernmost point of Alaska. This is even colder than that. And this is your endless sea of black spruce boreal forest. Every winter it's hitting minus 50 degrees, true temperature somewhere deep in the interior. And even in Fairbanks, uh, which is the biggest population center in the interior, about 30,000 people, they're hitting minus 40 every winter. They used to hit it many times every winter and now it's kind of seeming like maybe once a winter they get down to minus 40 for a stretch. The definition of the interior also in this picture on the uh, the right here, you've got the Alaska range. That's the, the range with Denali, which is this mountain here, the tallest peak in North America, well over 20,000 feet. And then you've got the Brooks range, which kind of anchors the North Slope. And the area in between that is the interior. Famous for Aurora. You can see Aurora in many places in Alaska, but the interior is the best. Those mountains do a really good job of stopping the clouds coming up from the, the ocean. Fairbanks is a very popular spot to go see that. I've seen it Aurora in, in my backyard in Anchorage though many times, every winter. A lot of these birds are the ones that you go to Zach's and Bog looking for. Um, Canada Jays, very common. Great gray owls, not common, but they're they're widespread and they're 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 everywhere. Um, but still not easy to see. Black pole warblers in the summer, spruce grouse, your boreal forest birds. And lastly, the North Slope. So this is the northernmost point in Alaska, north of the Brooks Range Mountains. And this is your Arctic tundra. And in the wintertime, you'll have 24 hours of darkness. In the middle of the day, maybe a little civil twilight. The sun will not rise for a couple months. Um, it's not pitch dark all day long, but, uh, in the summertime, it's pretty incredible. It is truly 24 hours of daylight. The birds, I don't know when they get their sleep because they are pretty much active all day long. The shorebirds, the ducks, they take little naps here and there, but they are going hard. And it's, it's a very short breeding season for these birds. So it kind of makes sense. 
pectoral sandpipers. That's one doing actually a display fight. They inflate their vocal sac and give like a booming call, kind of like a, kind of like a grouse, very unique. Um, and they're very abundant in the tundra, in the North Slope. Red phalaropes all over the place, very tame. A lot of these birds are very tame. The rare eiders are where a lot of people go up there. So this is a spectacled eider. And then snow buntings, they're almost like your, your house sparrows up here. They're nesting in uh, birdhouses and little gutters and pipes, and they're everywhere in full breeding plumage. So in all of those areas, and some of the smaller ones in between, there's a uh, official list stands at 545 species of birds in Alaska, which is big, really big. That's fifth highest in the U.S. Um, and we're creeping up on New Mexico. I hope to overtake them at some point soon. Uh, not too far off of Arizona. However, Texas and California have blown away everyone else. We have this little uh, informal club, 200 club, 300 club, 400 club. But because of how big the state is and how hard it is to get to places, uh, there's not even that many people that have seen 300 of these 500 birds. Um, and there's only a few people that have seen 400. Um, whereas like in Illinois, the, the biggest listers have seen a higher percentage of the total list, if that makes sense. Um, and that's a Stellar's Jay on this little patch here. So yes, as I alluded to, um, the, the tricky part is the logistics really, and, and getting to all these places. And these are all pictures that I took. Um, this is a, a flat tire we were dealing with on the North Slope on the Hall Road, the oil, the oil road up to the North Slope. This is a float plane in Southeast Alaska. And this is our, our base camp for birding in uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park in the interior of Alaska. There's a few tents down here if you can see them. And one of the biggest reasons it's hard to get to places is because we have such a limited road system. So this blue line down here is the marine highway. So that that's not roads, just these red and black lines. And the marine highway, the ferry system is pretty limited, seasonal. Um, it's not a huge, and it was, and it also doesn't go to too many different places. Um, like for example, all of Western Alaska. And if you look at the road system, it doesn't also go any farther west than maybe the central dividing line of Alaska. Um, this is Anchorage here, Fairbanks, Juneau. Juneau is not connected to any roads. That's our capital, uh, about 30,000 people, only accessible by air and uh, ferry. And um, there's really, really big coastal mountains and glaciers between Juneau and Canada, and I guess it's just way too much money, way too difficult to build a road there. And uh, kind of a fun fact. So for example, I wanted to go through a few species and just kind of go through what it would take to go see them. Um, American bittern, not a terribly difficult bird to see in Illinois. However, in Alaska, there was only one marsh where you can reliably see it. And it is way down in Southeast near the town of Wrangell. So you can't even get to Wrangell with a nonstop flight from Anchorage. You'd have to stop either in Petersburg um, or Ketchikan first, and then you go up to Wrangell. And then you'd be taking a jet boat down the Stikine River all the way just about to the Canada border. You'd have to bring canoes. You'd have to bring your own food. You'd have to bring tents. And this would be a several day expedition a lot of mosquitoes, there's brown bears, there's black bears. And um, this marsh right here, Barnes Lake, is a pristine marsh. Birders don't even visit it every summer. And that is where the American bittern uh, hangs out generally. Not a guarantee. Uh, my friends did that. These are pictures of theirs. And they got it. This was in 2020. I tried to do it in 2021. However, there was like 120 degree temperatures in British Columbia after a massive snowfall winter and the, the river marshes flooded. I don't even think it would have been safe to try canoeing on the river at that time. So I wasn't able to do it. And that's, that's the kind of thing that can stop you in Alaska. Not something you really probably consider too much in, in Illinois, but it's also kind of what's cool, really. 
Here's another one, Timberline Brewer Sparrow. This is a subspecies of Brewer Sparrow, poorly known. It's the northern population in Montana and then also through uh, British Columbia and the Yukon Territory. And then there's one little dot in uh, the interior of Alaska. This wasn't even discovered until 1992. And breeding was confirmed in 1993. And it's just a, in this very narrow elevational band. They're actually there every year, several pairs. I did do this in uh, 2020. And it entailed uh, flying in a Cessna on a, it's called a mail plane. Um, so it's taking mail to a very small old mining community. And they usually sell a couple seats for much more affordable prices than chartering. We put our bear spray on the wing, because if it explodes in the cabin, that would be really bad. It'd probably incapacitate everyone, including the pilot, and we'd crash. Apparently, not even every pilot's okay with you putting it on the wing, um, but most are. If they aren't, I don't know what you'd do. Uh, you'd have to rely on uh, guns to defend yourself against bears. But uh, that's us climbing up these mountains hiking. Um, it was a several mile hike. I can't even remember, but it was, I remember it being very brutal and, uh, we had 50 pound packs on again. This is like a multi-day expedition, at least three days, uh, to do this. Absolutely beautiful country. Um, this is our base camp. This is the, the habitat, the, the willow that they nest in at about 5,000 feet and 5,000 feet in Alaska because of how far North we are, depending on where you are is treeless. So we have much lower timberline in Alaska. And getting to 5,000 feet is much harder than in other places. Stunning trip. We did see the bird. Fantastic. Here's another one. Whiskered auklets. Um, they are limited to the very far western Aleutians. And they're also on the, uh, the Asian side a little bit. But also quite difficult over there. And there's only a couple towns that are within striking distance of some of the breeding colonies where you can charter a boat. Uh, when you do get there, there's thousands of them, and they're absolutely stunning. They're very small auklet um, with the coolest facial pattern, uh, but it is very difficult to do this and very expensive because you have to charter a boat. It's at least a few thousand dollars, and it's an all-day trip to go get there. This is me on the boat. Um, this was 2021. And this is the Baby Islands. This is Dutch Harbor. It's like a 50 mile steam to get there and the boats don't go, don't really go that fast. So it, it took several hours to get there. Several hours to get back, beats you up. Um, and you need the right, can't be too windy. Can't be too wavy. You gotta, gotta watch the tide cause you don't want the tidal forces to counteract the wind, make it really choppy. But luckily we had a nice day. A lot of people have heard of Atu Island and that is the farthest Western island in the Aleutians, all the way out here, well west of the 180 degree line. However, they jog over the date line to keep it the same date as the rest of the country. Um, there used to be a Coast Guard base for a long time, and then they shut it down, which meant they stopped maintaining the runway where birders would charter flights into, and there was a company doing birding tours, and this is them actually up here with all their bikes through the early 2000s. Um, when that shut down, Another birder started a company of taking a boat out, and this was like, like a seven-day boat ride from Adak, which is already pretty far out. Um, and then you'd bird the island. However, in the 2000s and earlier, you'd have 50 people on a plane, and the boat could only accommodate like 12 people or 10 people. So it was a much smaller birding force. And now that guy stopped doing that. You just can't get out there at all. Really no reasonably no reasonable way um, unless you somehow have access to a massive ocean faring vessel on your own. Atu is very, very famous um, for particularly a lot of Asian species, even things like whooper swan and white-tailed eagle have bred there. Um, the only places they bred in North America. And then this is a, a real film scan of a yellow-throated bunting that was seen there. And it's the only one that's ever been seen in North America ever to this day. So it's a spectacular place and we just can't even get there anymore. Um, it's the end of an era. The last one I wanted to hit on here is the gray headed chickadee. So I think maybe some of you have heard of this one. 
this is, I'd say without a doubt, the hardest breeding bird to find in North America. They're easier in Europe, but also declining fast there. Um, and these are in remote mountain streams in the Brooks range. And you have to charter your own flights to get in here and do a rafting expedition at least a week plus. But what's really troubling about these is that they haven't been seen since 2017, which is now almost seven years. Um, and they've already, the range has contracted in Alaska. They haven't even been seen in Canada for decades and decades. Um, it's really starting to seem like it's actually on the verge of extirpation from North America. And almost no one's even paying attention to this. It's getting very little funding. Um, it almost feels like this is a bird that none of us who haven't, if we haven't seen it yet, that we'll have a chance to get it in Alaska. And it's kind of a microcosm of some of the other problems that we're facing. So it's it's thought, and it's very poorly known, but it's thought that maybe the warming climate is changing the vegetation structure, is allowing maybe boreal chickadees to go farther north and outcompete them. Um, that could be a reason why they are so scarce. With that said, it's a lot of land, a lot of country. We hope that maybe there's some populations hanging on. It would be very hard to find them. Um, but birders are going at least once a year to areas where they have been seen historically every year up until 2017, and now they're still not getting them. And this kind of segues into some of the other themes of the presentation. So Alaska is so far north, climate change affects more northern latitudes much, much faster, much more than lower latitudes. And the in the last 60 years, average temperatures in Alaska have risen about three degrees Fahrenheit. And that's twice as much as temperatures have risen in the lower 48. One of the biggest ways you can see this is in sea ice. This is actually a, um, a satellite scan of the sea ice yesterday. These are the Pribilof Islands where I go to in the summer. And used to be in the winter, every winter, sea ice would reach the Pribilofs. Now, most winters, it does not. We're very lucky if it barely you know, scrapes by St. Paul. Um, and the sea ice, it's a whole uh, kind of cascading effect because when there's sea ice covering the ocean, it reflects the sunlight, which then keeps the ocean colder. So when there's no sea ice, then the sunlight penetrates and warms the ocean. And then it's just, and it melts the sea ice, which then creates it to warm even more. And it just kind of makes everything worse. These are a couple graphs that kind of say the same thing. Um, the average or median is that hashed line on the left or the dark gray line over here. And these are all the recent years of sea ice. This is um, this fall, September 29th, September 19th of, uh, of this past fall. And not even, not even really close to, to the average. And that average is also only the 1981 to 2010 average, which it was already declining. Um, if you were to compare it to like the fifties or earlier. So it's not great news. And it's having very real effects to people, actually. Um, on St. Paul and the Pribilofs, the Opelio snow crab is the biggest industry. And it, it, in tax revenue for the city of St. Paul, it's something to the tune of, I think, $5 million a year. And they depend on that to run trash collection and city services and you know, buy gasoline in advance for the residents and everything like that. And for the last two years, they have completely shut down the harvest of Opelio snow crab, um, which is unprecedented. I mean, you can see this one headline here, disappearance of 10 billion snow crabs, almost certainly due to um, this warming ocean and it's, it's all connected. I think also trawling has got to be a big factor here. Um, doesn't seem like we've seen the regulations that we need to stop trawling and all the bycatch of, of species in the Bering Sea. Um, but it's, yeah, very unfortunate. And with when you take something out of the ocean, it's very easy for something else to come in and take that foothold in that niche, in that spot that the previous species had, which possibly could never let that other species come back. 
Uh, this happened with King Crab in the 90s. It's never rebounded uh, ever again. There's very low levels of King Crab remaining in our side of the Bering Sea and very, very small harvests every year. Hopefully, that will not be the case here, but time will tell. Spruce bark beetle. Seems like everywhere has got some dang insect that's causing problem with trees. This one is actually native to Alaska. However, the warmer winters have allowed them to have population explosions. It's allowed them to go farther north into Alaska, well into the interior, not getting those super cold temperatures to knock them back. And then they're able to attack more healthy trees because there's so many of these beetles. So there's a lot of places in Alaska that have huge swaths of the black spruce all dead. And that's from beetles. It's not from fires. Um, pretty jarring to see. I didn't want to end on such a negative note. So I think you guys will all get a kick out of uh, this next slide here. Um, some of our, our most famous and most uh, sought after rarities on the mainland in Alaska, like in Anchorage or Southeast, are some of your trash birds in Illinois. So like, I've seen all of these in Alaska. I even got on a plane to look for house sparrows. Uh, these two were in far Western Alaska, probably came over from Russia. Cowbird, grackle, coot. These are all rare birds for us. So it's all relative sometimes. Pretty funny, pretty amazing. And then I wanted to end it on uh, a very famous poem that I really enjoy. I think it's actually uh, based on the gold rush in the Yukon, but the Yukon territory is kind of our sister state, if you will. So... There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The Northern Lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Thank you. And now I will do as many questions as you guys want. Uh, I just unmuted myself and now I need to see everybody. Um, there's a chat. I, I forgot to mention that at the beginning and oops, now I'm on completely large chat. That won't work. Um, so please, uh, put your, uh, questions in the chat. Um, Sully, I can't, can everybody see Sully or we're still seeing your screen? I think, um, okay, Sully, do you want me to stop sharing? yeah, why don't you? So we can see you. Okay. There we go. Sally, I'll ask the first question, and then again, please um, put your questions in the chat. What brought you to Alaska, and why do you stay? <laughs> so I love it, personally. Love everything about it. Um, I went to Alaska with the job of going to St. Paul in 2018. Um, I'd always dreamed of working out there, and I'd always dreamed of traveling to Alaska in general and birding, because you always see those such unique birds in the field guides that... Uh, can't see anywhere else like blue throats and arctic warblers and things like that and jeer falcons and it always felt out of reach to me though um however took the job and uh have, and with all the traveling back and forth i do with between alaska and chicago now it's really not that out of reach as i thought it was it is an expensive place but uh basically the birding and the job took me to alaska yeah you mentioned things like jeer falcons which I mean, are they common? That those are some of the birds you just mentioned. You didn't um, cover in your presentation. Yeah. So, deer falcons. Um, I wouldn't call them common. However, Alaska is the, you know, a core part of their range, and um, there are places where you can go and you can have confidence that you're going to see see them. There was one, unless I'm misremembering, a couple of years ago uh, turned up in. Waukegan, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. And I was there and it, 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 I got there about five minutes before it flew away. <laughs> Joel Greenberg was there, part. by the way, and he it was like he was the, hosting everybody. He was so excited to see it. Uh, Lisa Poole asked, what's special about St. Paul Island versus other islands in the area? One of the most special things about St. Paul, in addition to the vibrant community and um, how welcoming they are and everything, the cliffs have very good 
access to them. Um, you don't have to get on a boat to see the seabirds like you do in the Aleutians. And you can get like cell phone pictures that you put on Instagram of puffins and auklets. It is really a name for itself with bird photography, especially. And then later on, we discovered that there were all these Asian vagrants, these rarities showing up as well. And a lot of the birders are interested in seeing those like bramblings, Asian finches, like some of the stuff you'd see on Attu. Not quite as good as Attu because Attu is so much farther west, um, but still really good. Okay. Um, Bob Stanley said, asked, many Alaskans seem to have a very independent, individ individualistic spirit. Is there much environmental concern in terms of trying to save struggling species, whether they're rare birds or snow crabs? Good, good, interesting question. That's a good question. Yes. And I, I would agree. Um, a lot of Alaskans are very individualistic and very like self-reliant because you almost have to be. And again, there's, it's such a big state living in downtown Anchorage is very different than living in the bush, you know, hundred miles outside of Fairbanks. But, um, I would say that, um, yes, there's many, many people that are very environmentally concerned and trying to do what they can. I know some recent things have happened lately, like, uh, not selling more oil leases in the Arctic refuge and nearby areas. And I know saving, um, a lot of the logging in the Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska. So there's good work being done there. Um, Alaska is a lot of federal land. So the federal government decides a lot of what can and can't be done rather than the state government. It's also a lot of public land, which is nice um, for someone like me who wants to go exploring. Um, but yeah, that answers the question. So, I suppose, uh, let's see, I'm looking for Linda Lutz and, and Steve Meyer, who were going to Alaska, um, and Ruth was there. If you were, if you wanted to do a birding tour, and it, based on what you were talking about, I mean, nobody is going to go on a raft or, <laughs> you know, three days on I wouldn't a expect boat, it. but what would be the common... Uh, it's never common, but what would be the normal trip that somebody would take to Bird Alaska? Yeah, there's a lot of tour companies that offer kind of the cookie cutter, if you could call it that, Alaska birding tour. It always takes place in May and June. because That's kind of the beginning, tail end of spring migration that far north and the beginning of the breeding season. And you can really rack up a species list, almost over 200 species in a few weeks. You generally hit Nome. You generally hit Barrow Utkiakvik which is the indigenous name uh, in the North Slope. You do some birding around Anchorage. Um, and then there's like some little extensions. Pribilofs are not a standard part of those tours. It's usually an extension. Um, I would say bite off as much as you can chew. You know, you don't have to do everything in one go. I mean, it is a gigantic state. Um, even just doing a trip to Nome and birding around Anchorage would be spectacular. Generally speaking, if you're going to pick one place, Nome seems to be the best bang for your buck. Willow ptarmigan and rock ptarmigan and jeer falcons are good there. Um, blue throats and arctic warblers. Uh, but yeah, you can kind of look online. There's, there's a lot of itineraries out there. But if you're staying, you're flying from city to city. That's how you get there. Yeah. Well, that's cities. A, that's <laughs> how it goes. Yeah. Alaska Airlines those major, major cities like Nome and uh, Barrow. Alaska Airlines is serving those cities on 737s, but they're not on the road system. So you, you have to fly. And even, you can even run into issues with ice fog in Barrow and things like that. Uh, but that's just part of, part of life in Alaska. What is a blue throat? Blue throat is a Asian... It's technically in the family of Asian flycatchers, um, like spotted flycatchers in England. Uh, they have a beautiful blue throat. It's a great name for that bird. And it's one of the Asian species that has colonized parts of Alaska. I'm going to show a little picture here. Um, I mean, Ooh. it's like, like nothing like nothing you have anywhere else in North America. Um, 
I mean, that's their, that is their range. So I guess it's reversed, but get the idea. Are you or anybody you're working with doing any bird research out there? The Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, which is massive, has thousands of islands all across the Aleutians and has land in the Pribloffs. They have seabird crews that have a long-term study going on. Seabird numbers, much like a lot of the fish in the Bering Sea, they've declined together. So there are still a lot of seabirds, but there's not as many as there used to be. Um, still spectacular, um, but yeah. And there absolutely is lots of research. It's okay, Linda's, Linda's asking, what are the most common species you can expect to see on St. Paul? So for, what's, what's in your backyard, Sully? <laughs> yeah, for, for land birds, um, I mentioned it. Uh, we've got rosy finches, gray crowned rosy finches, snow buntings, Lapland longspurs, and Pacific wrens. And that's it. Um, we've got rock sandpipers that breed there that are incredibly abundant. And then it's the seabirds that everyone wants to see. And all of these birds that breed there are not hard to find once you get to the island. Red faced cormorants, northern fulmars, three auklet species, crested auklet, least auklet, parakeet auklet, um, horn puffins, tufted puffins. Those are the two Pacific Ocean puffins. I showed the horn puffin on one of the slides. Uh, that kind of thing. The, the ironically, the gray crowned rosy finches are actually like the gregarious bullies house sparrow niche bird there. Uh, really, really uh yeah, it's such a hard they, they even sound like house sparrow, but yeah, they're they're really mean. And there's another chat, but I, I had a question on the seabirds. Are you t doing a pelagic or are you are do you see them from the shore? All from land, all from just a very short walk from the road, which is really nice. Um and we have cars on St. Paul, which is amazing to begin with uh it the best views are from walking up to the cliffs because if you're from a boat you wouldn't be able to get that close to the shoreline you'd be yeah, really far back and uh, the birds also feel very safe on the cliffs that's where they're not prone to getting predated by arctic foxes which we have there so there's no disturbance reminds me of being in newfoundland where the northern gannets are and <laughs> I, I remember sitting in the middle of where I shouldn't have been. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's so many. Um, let's see. Do you have any favorite field guides or books to get before traveling? Yeah, um, I've always really liked Sibley guides. However, for Alaskan birding, I also really like the National Geographic guides. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason being is uh, number one, there's many more accidental species included with National Geographic. And they do a much better job talking about the subspecies with actually the Latin names for the subspecies rather than like the made up common names that Sibley puts like Great Plains or something. It's kind of confusing. Um, but even birds that have just shown up a few times in Alaska are included in the National Geographic guide. So when you're birding in Alaska, a lot of those birds are actually real possibilities. Um, Sibley's added more Asian species with his newer guy, but still, I think National Geographic is my my favorite for Alaskan birding. I assume there's a bird pack on Merlin or something. Yeah, I want to have it. I have it. <laughs> the bird yeah. recordings on Merlin are amazing for, for okay. studying. Yeah. All right. Anybody else before we let Sully get ready to leave tomorrow? <laughs> to go home. 